silence your phone and give it to me and let me use it for a few hours to text or use whatever I can do in your, on your device. But uh, we, uh, this is one of our number of activities that we schedule uh, not only for the remainder of this year, but in 2022. And so in just a moment, I'm going to turn it over to Mary Ellen and let her introduce our uh, presenter tonight. Uh, but thanks again for being here. In case you don't know, that's John Beard, our current REGS president. So I, I don't know if some of you knew that or not, but I thought we should make that introduction. Um, also in the audience is a foundation member, Patrick McClellan, and Tom Habel. I thought I saw Tom. There's Tom. And I think you all know each other, basically. So, so we know the draw tonight is, is, is Doug Rasmus, and we are so excited to have him here and talk about his book and share with us some of his uh, memories of growing up in Richmond. And um, it's been so long since we've all been together, so this just feels really great to come together in our community center again. And as you know, Doug is the son of uh, Ken and Jean Rasmussen and the grandson of Gon, uh, John Guy Fletcher. He is a husband, a father, a scholar, a lawyer, and an author. And I have to tell you, he is just one of the nicest men I've ever met. And we just met. So, <laughs> so, I, so I wanted to get that up. But I, but I asked Doug to share with me some of his uh, biographical information. And he reluctantly did send me some of that, but he asked me to please not dwell on it. So I looked at all of his information, and if I were to dwell on it, we would be here till way past our bedtime, which is generally 8.30, 9 o'clock. So, so I'm not going to dwell on that, but I have to say that he is quite an accomplished man, and I think we should all be very proud that Richmond is where he grew up and where he started his path to success. Um, there, I, I read his book, and I'll be very honest with you, I did not read thoroughly all 40 generations, um, but I did read the beginning of the book and uh, the stories that he tells in that book and the, the way he describes his home life and his family and the love he had for his family and that he got from his family just pulled at my heartstrings. They're beautiful stories about growing up in Richmond and I think many of us can relate to some of those stories, so I encourage you to take a look at that book. Um, I would like to, it, what, there's one quote in the book um, that he, he put in his book, and it was from Lawrence Dugan, and he described Lake Michigan, and he said, and I quote, where future and past seem to meet if they do anywhere. And I thought about that for a moment, and I thought about our little village over there, and when all of those children come to the school dressed in their old time apparel and they go into that school and they touch the past and they are the future. So not only does Lake Michigan provide that for us, but our little village over there does too when those children come and visit. And when the children walk through the memorial uh, bricks and they bend down and they touch the names of their grandparents or aunts and uncles that have a memorial brick there. Again, our, our future is touching our past. When the Donnelly family comes in and they celebrate their family reunions and they bring in their family and they look at the cabin and that past and the history they have there and all of their young ones are there, the future is touching the past. So that happens a lot right here in, in our village and I think that's something that all of us can be very proud of because we all have been a part of that in helping that grow in some way. So without further ado, I would like Doug to share with you his memories of Richmond, his genealogical search, and I think he's going to help us uh, avoid some of those pit falls when, when we're doing our search because we all go down those rabbit holes and I've been down many 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 of them so I'm hoping he shares some of uh, his wisdom with us on how to avoid some of that. Doug Rasmussen.
Well, thank you for that nice introduction, Mary Ellen. And it's really heartwarming to be back in Richmond to see so many old friends and relatives, too. We have a few here tonight. Um, I can tell you that I have some very, very fond memories of my childhood here in Richmond. The first 24 years of my life was spent here, and it was the 24 years of my life that enriched my own future uh, in many, many ways. First of all, though, I would like to uh, salute your historical and genealogical society, along with its board uh, and uh, officers and members, for what it contributes to Richmond and its residents and to the public at large. You know, the first place I go to when I go to a venue to pursue leads and to uh, try to make discoveries of my genealogical past, I always try to go to the local historical and genealogy society first. I found them, like yours, a very, very authoritative uh, source of finding material. For example, here's one, the Richmond area history. That's in my bibliography in the book. It was a great, great source of material for me. Especially seeing this picture of the hotel on the cover. And the hotel, believe it or not, was on the property at one time uh, where the Fletcher residence is, uh, was. And Alexander Beebe uh, built this hotel on what is uh, originally on what is now the Fletcher, re was the Fletcher residence. And then at one point in time, that uh, hotel was either demolished or moved across the street to become this hotel. So the ties of the Fletchers go back to the very founding of Richmond. And I'm proud of that fact. And it's through you that continues to carry the memories of that past to the future. Um, so keep up the great work as do all historical and genealogy societies. And don't forget, if you need information in a small town in Massachusetts, they have a wonderful genealogy society there. And I even use the largest genealogy and historical society in, in, uh, in the United States, the New England uh, Historical and Genealogy Society, as a reference for much of the material on, on the Fletcher past. And they have a website today, it's all digital. Even that society has all their stuff. I could find a Fletcher history in the uh, online now. Most of my work before I did the, I, I wrote the book, uh, was done before the digital uh, era had really caught on in genealogy. It was starting, it was definitely there. Some digital things here, some there, but now they've, in the last 10 years, it's multiplied just exponentially so that that information is now in your living room rather than traveling around as I did. But, I, but don't make any mistake about it. I enjoyed every inch and every mile of those travels. They brought to me a part of genealogy that is not thought about very much. And that's the fulfillment you receive in walking the walk, in talking the talk with the locals who knew your family or could help you find information about the family and knew where some of the unrecorded information was that uh, genealogists seldom, if ever, discover when they're doing their work. Second, uh, there is a lady in Richmond. I don't know whether she's here tonight. I, don't, I haven't seen her. But I just want to uh, acknowledge uh, who made a wonderful contribution to my life. And I am deep full, deep fully, <laughs> deeply grateful for what she did. I get kind of choked up even when I think about it. She has always been my favorite teacher in the Richmond High School, Lucia Marshall. You are there. Now, for those of you who don't know why I make this choice, she was my French teacher for four days. 
and then she announced that it was no longer going to be a French class. She was going to be teaching us speech. Well, I was not disappointed. She taught me all the skills to become an orator that I used in the state regional speech contest that year, my sophomore year, to become its winner. A first for an RHS student. I couldn't have done that without her instruction. I have relied on those skills all my life. So here is a great shout out for Lucia. Thank you so very much. You're welcome. Now let's talk about some genealogy concepts in general before getting down to the, uh, some of the nitty gritty. Tonight I will share some pertinent parts of my recent book, which highlights my discovery of how my blood ancestors intersected over several centuries with significant historical events, especially during the American Revolution in the 1770s, as well as at the execution of other major historical documents. When I did my research, I concentrated on the papers I could find of my ancestors, which in particular have contributed to the advancement of liberty and justice. The ultimate goal of publishing the book was to produce an example of how to put family genealogical discoveries into a permanent or lasting written repository. In addition to putting it into such a form, I wanted to make sure that format was preserved. So this book I placed in 17 prominent libraries throughout America. All libraries I had a contact with that helped make this genealogical possible, research possible. They are also in England as well. So the information that is in the book should be, a, be preserved and discoverable in the future, as is now possible. Uh, I'm excluding going onto the cloud and digitally you can do all kinds of things for permanent uh, preservation. But the hard copy, the facts, the documents, and by the way, all of the documents that were not public records uh, that are footnoted in more than 500 footnotes in the book, those personal documents, like a speech I gave, were all collected and placed in the archives of the Family History Division of the Herrick District Library in Holland, Michigan, where we now live. That's one thing their library has done that few others have done, allowed their local citizens to create repositories of findable, unrecorded information, stories, poems, uh, whatever is in writing can be preserved permanently. So all of, my, all of my documents that are not public documents and can be served publicly to, to check on my veracity, uh, the unpublished the stories, the poems, etc., can be found in the Herrick Public Library. Um, the ultimate goal of publishing the book then, as I say, was to provide an example how to put genealogical discoveries into a lasting document. Now, uh, a little bit of a, an author's retrospective here. I am not anything but an amateur gene genealogist. That is not my profession. I don't profess to know how to do it in technically the right way in all regard. So I had a license to kind of be a little bit loosey-goosey in what I did from the pure genealogical explanations. Why? Because stories are stories from the heart. They're not necessarily for the census document. And who's gonna tell those stories? Who's gonna know those stories? Who's going to remember those stories? So if you have stories, and you do, because you can sit down in an afternoon and say, oh yeah, I remember the vacation we went to and had trouble. I remember this. I remember you know, my first date, da 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 da. 
Well, make notes on them. One vignette on each f file card. Put them in a pile. Then you can sort and sift and put, oh, this kind of goes with this one. This one kind of goes with that one. You kind of put it together. That's what I did with a lot of the personal papers I found. The personal papers, to get them, are immensely important. I know my two sons, adult sons, on my death would look at these boxfuls of papers in the, in the basement and say, mm. <laughs> on the truck. <laughs> but maybe his great-grandchild will wonder what was going on in that century of the 1900s and the 2000s. And uh, hey, there's a research that's been done for them. I've cut off hundreds of years of life of this family line, put it into a book and bound it so that they may have the information at hand without lifting a finger, if they choose to. <laughs> they don't have to. <laughs> okay. Now, I want to say something about my, my family to begin with as far as genealogy is concerned. I knew nothing about my family beyond that of my grandfathers and grandmother, grandmothers and grandfather that were living at my uh, birth. And all three of them died within 90 days when I was 13. And we all lived in Richmond. I could ride my bike to both my grandma Rasmussen and my Fletcher grandparents. Short bike ride. I was there all the time. They were main features in my lifetime as a young boy. So, uh, but beyond that, nothing. And did I ever learn anything s since then? Not for the next 50 or more years. Not a word, not a scribble, not an inkling. And then when I retired and we moved to Holland, uh, uh, my wife and I took a genealogy class at, the, at a senior citizen uh, ad adjunct to Hope College. Wonderful program. They teach classes to themselves. We had, uh, we had uh, physicists and uh, engineers and, and people who had patents and people who had been in the high in the military, all walks of life getting together that you had to have a college degree to be a part of this professional organization. But you could go to classes and you could give classes. I've given a couple of classes, uh, one on the U.S. Constitution. And I was not a constitutional lawyer. I had to teach my, I had to go back and relearn constitutional law from my second year law school to be able to teach that class, believe me. But I'm sidestepping here a little bit. Uh, the reason that that organization was important as they had a beginner's class on genealogy. And so that just kind of caught us both by surprise and we jumped in and we haven't jumped out since. <laughs> both my wife both got the bug and, and she probably more than I did more to contribute to the success I had making these discoveries. I certainly uh, pay my wife Andrea my uh, deep gratitude for all the assistance she gave me on this project. Well, uh, after doing a lot of field work by traveling around to where, to the hometowns of these uh, ancestors, and by the way, I found out a list of about uh, seven names, six or seven names. And you know, well, six or seven names can constitute more than se several decades. Uh, in fact, almost a century. So, if, but all I had were those names then, but we did a lot of digging to get those names. So I had a list, and that was the first thing I did, of constructing a family tree line from myself, through my mother, through Guy Fletcher Jr., her, her father, and then the Fletcher line all the way back. You know, just names. So uh, I was devoted then to the, to the goal of trying to find out more information by searching out the stories, even if we had to travel to their hometowns and dig it out the hard way. In uh, transferring all my research into this book, 
I have broken many of the rules of writing history and genealogy. For example, I wrote the work backward in time. I started with myself as generation one, my mother as generation two, my grandfather generation three, all the way back to generation 40. Now usually genealogists start with the history of Methuselah, and then the sons and daughters, and, the daughter, and then you get this branching thing that gets wider and wider and more lines and more lines, and you get lost. And so I, I was lucky to find one line of the thousands that you have, and, and I'll put a parenthetical in here, you probably all know that the number of your ancestors doubles every generation back, like two parents, four grandparents, eight great-grandparents on until you go back 10 generations, you've got 1,012 lines to follow. So coming down there and searching frontwards in the typical way, genealogists love to do that because they like to know everybody, everybody. Well, I wasn't interested in everybody. I was interested in my line, especially when I found a line as deep as the Fletcher line was in this country. It went back. 500 and some years from 1583 to 1953. And what is remarkable, what was remarkable about the Fletchers in America is that Guy Fletcher, his father was a Fletcher, obviously, and that man had a Fletcher father, and that man had a Fletcher father, and on and on and on. Or looked at the other way, it was a son of 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 a son, all named Fletcher. Well, I'm not named Fletcher, but my mother was a daughter, so she broke that all-male line. It doesn't change the bloodiness of the credentials, it just makes it one female in the line. But it was easier for me to follow an all main line because the name change didn't occur. It remained the same. So uh, I followed that line by choice. Um, I picked, I, I did this story in really in short vignettes. You can pick up the book and read a vignette, put it away and pick it up and read another one. It may be related. I've tried to kind of string them along in some sense of order. Sometimes I compare in one vignette something that's coincidental with one that happened before. Put the two together and say, wow, now I know why this happened, because it happened here and for this reason. And so you can do kind of like analysis and, and joining and rejoining to come up with some very interesting comparisons. So doing that, I use the techniques of flashbacks and flash forwards to kind of take one generation out of place and tickle it with a little bit of information from a generation far down or up the line and show how interesting that comparison might be. But you might say that's the way life has lived itself and remembered. Okay, uh, well, the book is not fiction. Everything is true, <laughs> believe me. It's not intended to be a history of the Western world. 40 generations takes us well before William the Conqueror. It takes us, in my case, to the year 740. I can track the line I had to take one of the Fletcher wives and break the Fletcher name as such, but through a grandmother uh, of one of the Fletchers, I was able to find a line through England and up through uh, a series of Flemish dukes to the ultimate uh, end in, 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 uh, in uh, Generation 40. And I, spoiler alert, I'll hold that just for a while as a teaser. <laughs> uh, so, this book is not an official genealogy with just name, rank, and serial number. And that's what you get when you buy it. If you want the genealogy of, 
XYZ, you'll get so-and-so was born, married, and died in the place of birth and the place of death, then on to the next. Well, that's only the first line of the vignettes. I, I have vignettes for each generation. I have stories to tell which, with each of these 40 people. They lived over a span of, of almost, well, 1,500 years, but I can trace every one of them. Uh, skipping over, I, as I, I guess I said before, hopefully the book can serve as an example or even a model for contemplating this type of project. Tonight, time, time does present uh, prevent me from discussing every chapter, but I will give you some glimpses of some of the key intersections I found that are historically significant. I hope you're half as amazed as, amazed as I was when I discovered them. Well, let us begin. It all started here in the Centennial Rasmussen Residence. That is my home, the home I grew up in. And uh, it was a Centennial House built in 1902 here in Richmond. And I took this picture in 2018. Well, the house was originally located on the southwest corner of Main and Division. Uh, and, and when I lived there, the railroad track was only a few yards from my bedroom window. <laughs> yes, I remember how the dingers, as we called them, too often stuck after the train went by, sometimes for hours and always in the middle of the night. I remember a train wreck on that corner. Believe it or not, a train wreck. It was an icy winter day when a truck filled of barrels of pickle relish slid on the ice and the train nicked the back end of the truck and the truck tipped over and all the relish dumped into our front yard. <laughs> Piles of it. The odor was unbelievable, but it melted the snow that it fell upon. My father and I, when the snow cleared, had to shovel all that uh, loaded uh, refuse, and, but no one was hurt, and uh, life went on at 6 South Main Street. Yes, that was our address, 6. How simple life was in the 50s in Richmond. But our telephone number, 14, please. The please was according to my mother's insistence never to be forgotten. And it simply became part of what you did when you cracked up the old wall telephone and uh, heard the first words you heard upon ranking, upon reeling and ranking the number was in her business proverbial question, number please? The house was moved off its foundations years later and rolled down Main Street uh, where it has been re beautifully preserved on Oak Street on the corner of Oak and Byer. I see some heads nodding. It's really a nice place. It still is, I drove by it today. I have many stories that occurred in and around that house as vignettes of how my life was lived in a small Midwestern town in the 50s, mostly to illustrate to the reader how to include family stories that one can be, that can be carried down through the years, which might otherwise never have been known or discovered later. So a, a few examples of stories I have included in my book about my past life include my stunning hiking adventure on Drummond Island as a 13-year-old and getting lost. An early family dinner that turned messy. I see some nods among family relatives there. My first driving experience, which ended in a wreck. That's true. 
Here's one I'll bet you none of you would ever even ever believe. Running for public office in Richmond in 1962 and winning. <laughs> Conducting a, a symphony orchestra. I did it. Meeting three U.S. presidents and learning one's very, very big secret, which I reveal in the book. And my sailing across Lake Michigan with my two sons with a scary encounter. So I picked and chose from a dozens of stories I listed and outlined, and I chose ones that I thought either had some, well, maybe humor, but were really relational to the 50s. It was a wonderful time in our country and a wonderful time in Richmond. My career stories as a lawyer uh, add some color to my years as a lawyer, but um, I don't break any uh, client privileges in there. I just do things that are kind of generic, including the unbelievable first day on the job as a lawyer in my new law firm. You won't believe it. Patty won't believe that one. And then, some experiences that were rooted in Richmond, but were kind of held outside the village limits, like Shabak and Hudson's downtown store in Detroit. And staring up at the Hudson's largest American flag in the world and being just awestruck, can a flag be that large? I mean, imagine a 10-year-old looking at that and just getting absorbed to building the largest department store in Detroit, coupled with a vignette where I was present when the wrecker, with his timed dynamite charges, did their work. The store imploded and was gone forever. I was there. Hope you enjoy that detail. Well, I'd like to turn for a moment in, to generation two now, my mother, Laura Jane Fletcher Rasmussen. Stories about my mother's generation portray a loving, stay-at-home mother of three children who dedicated herself to encourage them to pursue complete educations through college, something none of her family or any member of the Fletcher line had done before her going back to day one. Well, I think she would be delighted that all three of her children achieved college educations and received college degrees. So as her first, as her oldest child, I was first in the Fletcher line to go to college and receive a college degree. Makes you wonder. Makes you consider who you are. How did that happen to me? Well, my mother and Lois Wagner were the best of friends. And my mother was inspired by Lois to serve for years on the library board longest service of anyone that had served in, since its inception, I think. But not only to serve on a board, but to send her children over to the library. You know, we lived two doors from the auditorium, and the public library was on the second floor. And if we got testy, if we needed to run off some energy, you go over to the library and find me a book, or read the book and come back and tell me what you read about. Accountability in that crept in there. Well, uh, I think it not only in, uh, inspired me to read books, but it, uh, what the content of the books led me on to was a, a really a, a tremendous soaking up of knowledge that was just not necessarily in the classroom. My interest in reading has continued throughout my adult life, but really blossomed in my retirement age as I studied and began to study again history with a passion.
especially in the American history of the revolution. Finally, the book contains some of my mother's most intimate thoughts about life itself as she expressed them in poetic form. Not many, many people who knew her knew that. I collected many of her poems, and I have included text of some of her best writing in the book. This is a good example of how looking for the papers of an ancestor and preserving them can not only fulfill all who knew her, but all who would like to have known her in the past, in the bloodline. I also mentioned that I was able to include in the book some uh, old pictures, photographs, which in this day and age can easily be digitized. Hint, I use staples. It's a commercial for that store. Their work is phenomenal. They have great equipment. Their service people are wonderful. And it's, they do the really great work at a very reasonable price. It, it doesn't cost money to put a picture in a book. I can tell you that. Uh, it takes up space that otherwise they'd have to typeset. So they put the picture and shove it in digital form. Bingo, it's in there. So don't be afraid in your writing of a genealogy story that what am I going to do with these old pictures? Uh, th th as old as they can be, they can be used. I have a photograph in the book of my great-great-grandfather, which was taken probably in the 18, late 1860s. It's one of those tin types or whatever, but I was able to secure that. It's the last that's the oldest picture I have in the book of any, any descendant in the Fletcher line. Beyond that, you just have to go for, through written records, monuments, and other things. But pictures, 19th century pictures, they can be, they can be used. Keep that in mind. Okay. Naturally, if you engage in a product, a, a project such as mine, you may want to include stories about your own parent who is not the bloodline that you're following. Like my father was not in the Fletcher bloodline. He married into it, but it's just by marriage. But I couldn't resist. So I suggest, especially for your first generation or maybe two generations of people you know and lived with, your memories ought to include uh, the memories of your father. And um, I have, therefore, many of those stories this weekend that were unrecorded, and no one's heard these stories, but they're there. You may hear a few in the cemetery walk, and thanks to Dr. McClellan, who will assist in that uh, uh, ceremony at the cemetery this Saturday. Well, I won't duplicate them here, so join him, and, and I think it'll be a wonderful experience. I'm looking forward to it. However, I will say this. The towns of New Haven and Richmond benefited from the tireless efforts to provide advice and service to them as, his, as their personal pharmacist. His children and all that knew him remember him as a devoted Christian father who faithfully served his family and his community. I think some of the best vignettes in the book are about my father, even though he is officially not in the Fletcher bloodline from purely a genealogical point of view. So don't forget both parents. By the way, whatever happened to the stuff in the old pharmacy building? Well, there's an answer to that question. When he sold his store, he was about ready to dump it all. The basement of that store, which you've ne never been down into, was a, was a conglomeration of stuff going back to the, 19, but to the 1980s. Excuse me, to the 1880s. There were three drug stores that preceded my father, Denton and Lutz, and there was another one whose name I forgot, probably you know. But. Rather than throw stuff out, they had a basement, throw it in the basement. We recovered, and, and I 
supervised and assisted my father recover this stuff and put it in his basement just to store it. There were two glass, milk glass top antique soda tables, wrought iron. There were the soda tables in the drugstore in the early 20th century. Um, there were boxfuls of pharmaceutical bottles, you know, the fancy ones and the names on them and the herbs and the minerals and the materials were all there, different color, different shapes. They were all boxed up. From the soda fountain, the old brass, solid brass cash register that only had keys on it for every nickel, five, 10, 15, you could, if you, charge, you had to charge something divided by five. <laughs> Banana splits were only 35 cents then, but 35 was on there. Well, that, is, that was there. And the scales that you always see in a pharmacy where they measure, put a weight in one and then the, the amount of the product in the other. Um, all that stuff has been preserved and it's been donated to Ferris State University School of Pharmacy where he graduated. The first time a program of four-year pharmacy was offered in the state of Michigan, he became one of the first four-year pharmacists in Michigan. And when he was, uh, when he was, uh, took the pharmacy exam in Michigan to become a registered ph pharmacist, his score was registered as number one in the state. So he knew his stuff. And Dr. McClellan has some great stories about that. Um, I, could, I can't resist telling you this. I kept some of the stuff because I couldn't part with it. Like the label box, label for poison, tincture of iodine, turpentine, you know, they pulled it out and, and out of the label sticking out, ripped it off and put it on the bottle. Uh, that I have. The labels are still hanging out of each slot, just as if it had been used yesterday. And I have, believe it or not, from the soda fountain, I have the glass cylindrical straw jar. It had a metal cap. And when you took the metal cap, the straws all came up and flowered out on the sides because a, a metal pole went down there and pulled them up from the bottom. And you took your straw. The straws that are in that glass straw jar are the straws that were in there in probably 1925. I won't throw out the straws. <laughs> so, and there was a thread box. Yes, you bought your thread at the drugstore. And uh, there was a hand-painted spool of thread on the customer side of this box. And then behind the counter, the assistant, you pick out the color, and then the assistant would hand you your spool of thread. I have that as a table, made it into an end table. But all of this stuff, including the stuff I have, will all be in the pharmacy museum, where they have constructed, reconstructed a pharmacy uh, that was uh, available or pertinent to the beginning of the 21st century. And they've done a marvelous job collecting things from other old pharmacies around the country. So his will be there in perpetuity. So since it's mentioned in the book, people will know that and find that if they want to find it. Well, I'm about to move in a generational direction. Well, there it is. That's what it looked like circa 1958, my year of graduation. Three quarters of a century, three quarters of a century plus one years ago, I tiptoed through the front door of that building, probably with my mother holding my hand, to meet my first teacher, Mrs. Hunter, and begin my kindergarten year. 
All but two years of my pre-college public education took place in that building, where both my mother and father were graduates. My other two years were spent, don't forget this, at the Lennox School with my fellow fourth and fifth graders. We had to get bussed down there for those two grades. I think there was another grade taught there at some year or another, but that building I think is torn down, right? behind St. Augustine Church. Don't laugh. Oh, there was the composite of my class before the laughing matter. Um, yours truly is on the lower row. I had my pointer somewhere, but I think I dropped it. <laughs> anyway, forget it. Lower right hand edge. And the girl next to me, Pat Kalazinski, and gentleman three up the row there, Ralph Rines, and Mary Beth Hurt, fourth from the right. All four of us left Richmond High School that year and went to the University of Michigan. Go Blue. Now don't laugh. I was surprised as anyone when I was asked to be drum major of the newly formed RHS marching band. Well, who would turn that job down with all those pretty majorettes all around you? With head back, chin up, chest out, let's go! found that line around somewhere. Well, going back in time, on the second row on the right is my father as a sophomore in the class of 19, or in the class, and this was taken in 1929, of him in his sophomore year. Jean, as my mother was known to all of her friends and family, not Laura or Jane or Fletcher, Jean. Jean and Ken met there, right there. I don't know whether you all knew that. My mother and father both worked at then Denton Drugs. She, as a soda fountain clerk, my father behind the prescription case as its registered pharmacist. They were a total team. Years later, my mother is, is a, is, was a stay-at-home mother when their children were born, but years later she came back into the store. And she made one of the best business decisions ever made in 40 years of that store operating. She bought, she went out and bought a Hallmark franchise for Hallmark cards. And you know, things change over time in drugstores. Where do you think, what two products do you think drugstores do not sell now that they were the only place you could buy in the 1950s? I mean, there may be lots of incidental things, but just Think of these two. Pop. You didn't go to the grocery store for Coke or Pepsi or Verner's. You went to the drugstore and bought it by the bottle or by the case. We had cases of pop in the back room that you never saw. But it was, you know, we filled up the, you could, a lot of people would buy them cold. and We filled up the refrigerated part of the store and sold pop. Well, pop is not sold in the drugstores anymore, virtually at all. The other product, sadly, were school books. When my father first was in the drug business, the only place in Richmond you could buy a school book was the drugstore. They sold every school book that was sold. Well, what happened? I'll tell you. The Michigan Supreme Court in a lawsuit dictated that 
public schools must provide all the learning materials, school books, paper, whatever supplies to every child in school, free. I think they had some basic charge they could charge. And overnight, when that decision was handed down, the drugstore lost 40% of its revenue. It destroyed the revenue of the store. And I'll tell you one thing about my father. There wasn't a school student in the county, but mainly in Richmond, that if he needed a school book, he got it for nothing from my dad. Edu education was more important to him than the last buck. The opinion, by the way, was written by none other than Soapy Williams, a governor who at one time, I remember this to the day, came to Richmond and started walking up and down, politicking up Main Street. So I know this story because I heard Mr. Hazelhoon re re uh, recall the story to my dad. He was the owner of the paint store next door. Soapy went into the Hazelhoon paint store and, and chit-chatted with him and he said, Say, by the way, what's the name of the guy that runs the drugstore next door? And he said, oh, that's Ken Rasmussen. Oh, thank you very much. And then walked out. He walked over to the store. Hi, Ken, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, he, my dad certainly got a hi, Ken, who are you? About 20 years later. No offense to the policies behind this, but the coincidence of that I thought was quite stunning. Um, well, we'll take another picture. My mother and father, 36 years ago, were chosen to be the Grand Marshals of the 1985 Good Old Days Parade. Really, an honor of truly grand proportions in this community. I think it's fabulous. The town was as very proud of them as they were to have been so selected. There they are. No. There they are. <laughs> Their smiles are broad as they rode down, rode south down Main Street in this beautiful brand new red 1985 Ford Thunderbird convertible. <laughs> it was a thrill. In the, this photo, by the way, they were just about four houses past my mother's childhood home on their right, through up the street. You'll see it in a minute. And I will just say that years later, they, my mother and father, after that parade, were interred about a mile north of this photo in the Richmond Cemetery, in niches side by side forever. Small world. The Fletchers. That's who they say lived there. Now, I know Rich Weinert and his wife have done a great job uh, preserving and upgrading that home, and we're very indebted to see that happen. But uh, I took this picture in 2018. This is the uh, home of, from the early 30s until his death in the early 50s of my grandfather, John Guy Fletcher. He is generation three. From his generation back to generation 12, I reiterate, my Fletcher ancestors were all sons of Fletchers for over 350 years. Now, my Fletcher family line still does continue by that name, even though it, my mother broke it. She had a brother, Jack Fletcher, who had a son, Jack. Is he here? 
There he is. Here. There he is. And Jack has a son who has a son. A son, Michael, and a grandson, Lucas. So the Fletcher name is alive and well in Michigan through now up to 10, 10 generations in Michigan. The original owner of the property on which the house was built, I have covered that, the founding BD, BD family. So uh, I just wanted to mention that there is a photo of, the, of the, my Fletcher grandparents in the book. And the photos I use throughout the book of any family members that are living uh, were taken years in the past. I wanted to have you reflect on who they were when they were lively and not like when they become, yeah. Uh, they, they were a stunning couple, it was my point. And that's what I wanted to capture. And uh, he was born on a farm near what is now Lowell, uh, Kent County near Grand Rapids, Western Michigan. I was never able, even after uh, securing the professional service of a genealogist, to find a birth certificate for Guy. And that was a big hurdle that I had to overcome quickly, or I was going nowhere. Because without a birth certificate justification, you're through. Uh, before I tell you that story, we've gone a little bit about to about an hour, and I'd like to have you all just stand up and take a breather and, and stretch. Getting back to my third generation of Guy Fletcher, I just have a few more remarks and then we'll skip around uh, in the interest of time and not keeping you here all night. I could talk all night on these people, but obviously that won't happen. Uh, I mentioned that uh, Guy was born in, in West Michigan in Lowell. Uh, he was a farmer, but he did tinker, uh, we can assume, in uh, mechanics and around the farm as the Industrial Revolution was uh, proceeding. And, uh, but, as was true with many on the farm in the early 20th century, when uh, Henry Ford opened shop in Detroit and got going in the automobile industry, people flooded in from everywhere for the opportunity, and Guy was no exception. So he wasn't a florist all of his life. He started out and was a very successful pioneer worker in the Ford Motor Company. Uh, he told me once how much he regarded Henry Ford as a wonderful man, and that Henry Ford was on a first name basis with me. He said, you know, Doug, he called me Guy. And, you know, and he was you know, flattered to think that Mr. Ford, with all of his uh, famous, so, uh, personality and so forth uh, would stop to talk to his employees on a first name basis. But isn't that what Henry Ford really did? I mean, he was a man that related to people and through his wonderful relationships, he built, a, he changed the whole way things were done in manufacturing. I meant to say, uh, when I, I guess I was just finishing where I said I had a hard time finding his birth certificate. Well, I found it. I found a death certificate in Lakeland, Florida, where he died at their winter home. And uh, on that uh, death certificate, the informant was listed as Jack Fletcher, his son. And uh, such an informed piece of information from someone who would know the deceased, coupled with the fact that a Death, that a death certificate is a public record, and this affirmation was made on the, on the recorded death certificate. That sufficed as a primary source for verifying his birth. So that's a hint. If you can't find a birth certificate, you're having trouble finding it, go back and look at the death certificate again and see if there isn't some information there that might lead you to using that as a source. Well, uh, when, he, when uh, he joined Henry Ford, he moved to Detroit, and uh, together with his half-brother, Arthur Fletcher, a man I knew and called Uncle Art. They were like brothers, they were half-brothers though, but they were very close. 
Art uh, distinguished himself at the Ford Motor Company. Interestingly, I discovered that he was, he had many patents for the company. And I checked the patent records and indeed found one of the most interesting patents I ever expected to find. The patent on the sun visor, <laughs> which is ubiquitous today, but was a, was a uh, virtually century old act in a paper I found with his name on it that created such a thing that we take for granted, flip-flop. Well, the Great Depression shattered all of gay, uh, Guy's dreams and he returned to agriculture, shifted gears and began growing flowers for weddings and funerals. This business survived in, Michigan, in, in Richmond through to the Depression basically because no matter what, people would not give up flowers for those special occasions. It was an enormous long-term success in Richmond and the business expanded into growing fields and massive gardens of chrysanthemums, gladioli, sweet pea, calla lilies, and even potted geraniums, which were hot stuff in East Detroit coming from the Fletcher Gardens. I rode with him occasionally in his panel truck filled with three gallon tins that high and this big, I used to call them potato chip cans, but they were uh, about that big, filled with water and the gladioli or the chrysanthemums all bunched in. What a scene that was, opening that back panel truck door and seeing all that color. It was fun. Well, Guy was very active, it was a very active mason in Richmond and received a beautiful service from the masons at his funeral in Richmond, about four doors from where I lived at the time, the Howard Bauer Funeral Home, where his body had been returned from Florida. Uh, I first, it was the first f uh, funeral I had ever attended in my life at age 13, and I couldn't really visualize him as being dead, looking in the casket. I, I have that vivid memory. We, he's sleeping or something. Well, I had lost my only living grandfather and uh, not at the age of, not yet at the age of 13. Incidentally, the back cover of the book contains a picture of me at age four standing on the southern stone ledge of the stairway leading to my grandfather's front porch. Why was that a special time and place? The book answers that question, and I'm not gonna tell you, <laughs> unless you wanna ask me personally after the meeting. It'll cost $15. <laughs> I'm just kidding. If anybody really wants to know, I'll tell. Now let's skip to, J, to John Guy's grandfather for a little while, uh, and just a few moments as a matter of fact. John Gates Fletcher, Gershom, that's generation five. He was the first Fletcher in my bloodline to settle in Michigan, migrating from New England by way of New York in 1844, only six years after Michigan became a state. Really, he was a true Michigan pioneer. I, I tell you how I found out about how many sheep he raised in the 1880s in the book. Hint, state supplements to the decennial census reports are economic studies of rural America. You can find out how many bushels of corn, wheat, cows, chickens, acreage, plowed acreage, not plowed, income from it, and so on. I mean, it's a wealth of information. Those are the things stories are made of. You don't find those in just, uh, even in newspaper articles. That information is a very good source. Keep in mind, not just the census for 1930, what about the Michigan Supplemental Economic uh, addition to that, which are public records. But now let me slip further back in generations to spend some time sharing with you the discoveries that my wife and I made about John Gates Fletcher 
grand, John Gates Fletcher's grandfather, Gershom Fletcher. Gershom. Where'd that name come from? I found out. I opened my Bible, looked it up, and sure enough, it was in the index, looked it up in the Old Testament. He was the son of Moses. That's where the name came from. These were Puritan people. Well, the scene is Westford, Massachusetts, about 25 miles northeast of Boston. The year is 2012, and the events represent my first major ancestral discoveries in Gershom Fletcher Jr.'s hometown. That's the beautiful, architecturally preserved town hall of Westford. We started there. And to make a long story short, we found all of the records of birth, deaths, and marriages of all my, of four generations of my Fletcher family in one little town. So that expanded my reach significantly, <laughs> reach uh, into the past. Well, then next, we made a stop at the Western Massachusetts Historical Society building, a beautifully re uh, preserved old colonial building in the town that had been at one time a bank and uh, some other business, I guess. Um, we met the we met the director of that society who eagerly pulled out from a file of musty documents dated July 4, 1774. It was an original signed document called the Solemn League and Covenant. Note the date is exactly to the day two years before the signing of the Declaration of Independence. These small town undertakings are often overlooked by the macro historians of the revolution, but they were very significant in building public support for the cause, without which the revolution would easily have faltered. Later research showed that this one page paper was signed by every voting resident of Westford to serve as a total commitment of the community to embargo British goods and trade uh, in response to Britain's suffocating new actions taken by them to punish the colonists for impeding trade such as the Boston Tea Party. Revenge for the Boston Tea Party. All signers of this covenant were committing treason. They were British subjects still. They weren't Americans. They were British subjects. By signing this solemn League and Covenant, they could have been hung as traitors if they were caught. They took the risk of death as their final stand against the British. This document, by the way, was written by legendary Patriot Samuel Adams, not of the beer company, but the real set, <laughs> the real Samuel Adams. There it is. I took a picture of it at the Historical Society. This document was signed by Gershom Fletcher Sr., Gershom Fletcher Jr.'s father, and his uh, brother, Joshua Fletcher. So two generations of my great-grandfather signed this single document. And there's Gershom Sr.'s signature. And there is Gershom Jr.'s signature. It was a long document. I had to take pictures of it in segments to show you the whole list. This. Uh, now, I'd like to read uh, a synopsis of that finding, since it was so important to me, 
uh, as, I wrote in, as I wrote in the book. So this, these are words right from the book. The covenant was, and then this is in the document, entered into for the recovery and preservation of our rights. And then going back to my own words in the book, so what prior kings had granted could not now be subverted or withdrawn. This paper, without doubt, is the most exciting of all found in my ancestral journey in America. From the very grassroots of the fight for freedom and liberty, it, is, it has arisen as my own personal Magna Carta. The covenant signers were American-style barons, akin to the barons at the time they prevailed as English-style patriots over the refusals of King John to effectuate the Magna Carta in 1215. Both the signers of the covenant and the English barons in 1215 were patriots of right and justice. Their courage and victory is my legacy, and yours as well. We then went to, in West, still in Westford, to the J.V. Fletcher Library. Yep, not a great grandfather, but a cousin, another offshoot of the founding father of the, of the Fletchers in America. But uh, their genealogy section was unbelievable. Remember public libraries. They are also a very significant source. People often forget to go to the library. This library had more information than 20 different historical societies put together. It was unbelievable. She bought, brought out stacks of books and papers regarding the Fletchers. It was a bonanza. The librarian, Virginia Moore, uh, let us pursue these, and she even included a 100-year-old scrapbook that had, on their sesquicentennial that had been composed. And we kind of overlooked it. Uh, then on a coffee break a little later on, I saw this scrapbook still look, lying there and reached over and opened the cover and inside the plastic slip was a Xerox copy of a document that was handwritten on top, Town Charter. <coughs> Town Charter. So I took a closer look at it. It was just a one-page document and it was signed by Gershom Fletcher Jr.'s grandfather as the town clerk. This was a court order from the king that to be valid had to be verified and accepted by the town clerk. So now I had another paper, a written signature of Joshua Fletcher on the founding of the town of Westford. Now, I said it's only one page, but you know, so is the Magna Carta. One page. That's all it takes. This year, 2021, this signed charter document is 292 years old. And I'm still searching for Fletcher documents, and I've got one that's that old, almost 300 years old. Where does it stop? It didn't stop there. Um, now today, the city of Westford, after finding its founding document, is a city of 25,000 people. I mean, it's amazing, a little town, insignificant when Joseph, Joseph, Joshua Fletcher put his signature on that document. But think of it, 25,000 people. Now, one more story about Gershom Fletcher, and then we'll skip a lot of generations. It starts here. He gets a special highlight. <laughs> oh, that was a town chart. I'm sorry, that got a special highlight. <laughs> this is kind of a change of tone. I took this picture. Nobody here. Very peaceful. This scene is 16 miles from Westford. The all-wooden bridge is in its fourth 
restoration. Yet what happened here is beyond being historically important. Not so peaceful here on April 19, 1775. Sergeant Gershom Rus Fletcher Jr., Sergeant Gershom Fletcher Jr., and his trained Westford Minutemen Company were aroused in the early morning by the call spread by Paul Revere, his famous ride through Middlesex County, and this is in the heart of Middlesex County. The night to warn his fellow countrymen that the British were advancing on Concord. Suited up with their muskets on their shoulders, the Westford companies of Minutemen marched two by two, 16 sunny miles to the Concord Bridge. They were on what is, you see is the right side of the bridge. Uh, and I quote from a contemporaneous local historian in the book who wrote, quote, the Americans being in quick motion and within 10 or 15 rods, that's less than the length of a football field, a single gun was fired by a British soldier toward them which marked the way, pressing under Colonel Robinson's, he was the leader of the Westford Infantry, under his arm, went under the Colonel's arm and slightly wounded the side of Luther Blanchard, a Pfeiffer. <coughs> Reading further from the book in my own words, this first bullet's sound pierced the ears of Sergeant Gershom Fletcher, Jr. But that day, April 15, 1775, the retaliation from the Minutemen was instantaneous. With loaded muskets, they opened fire on the exposed British troops, killing many. The first of the enemy to fall in the Revolutionary War leading to a prompt retreat by the Brits from the bridge of the Concord, from the edge of the Concord Bridge. It secured for the fledgling American troops their historic first military victory. The world would never again be the same after Lexington Concord, where British redcoats had first fired on the American patriots, in response to which the first musket fired by an American cracked in the air, ever to be known as the shot heard round the world in the name of freedom and liberty. It also marked the moment where the British soldiers first died and retreated. Colonial America was in a revolutionary war for its life and liberty from that day forward. American Minutemen at Concord have truly become iconic battle heroes. Their immediate mission successfully accomplished, the Westford Minutemen companies returned to their hometown fully dispatched. On that sunny day, for certain, Sergeant Gershom Fletcher Jr. had given up all remnants of his British citizenship, including his 37-year life allegiance to royalty. Americans have enduringly saluted and recognized the American Minutemen in numerous public uh, documents and monuments. Here are a couple of photos I discovered of a couple. I have others, but I'm for tonight. <coughs> There's a plaque in that old building, the Westford Historical Society. It was, it was uh, put up there in 1770, or excuse me, 1976 on the U.S. Bicentennial. And the, from words on the plaque, to these and their comrades in arms, we owe the birth of liberty on these shores. And we rededicate our commitment to the principles for which they struggle. That's 
And Gershom's name is on that list. You can't see it on the slide. Another one is a picture I really like. I didn't take it, but it's in the public domain. This is a picture of the Minutemen Monument at the Cor Concord Bridge. It's on the left side of the bridge, on the British side, but it stands there as a wonderful uh, memento to those who uh, gave their lives. Here's, in, in the stone beneath it, it says, here stood the invading army, and on this spot, the first of the enemy fell in the war of that revolution, which gave independence to these United States. In gratitude to God, and in the love of freedom, this monument was erected A.D. 1836. And here's my favorite. This mon monument constitutes a stirring high point of commemorance, and it more than any other of my discoveries memorializes Gershom Jr.'s life story. My own written words reiterate, no one, no one of the papers revealing the fabric of Gershom Jr.'s life stands to honor his heroic patriotism in the revolutionary in that in the revolution and that of all other Minutemen more than this symbol which was created as the official seal of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts after it became an official state of the United States. It was crafted by Paul Revere. And it depicts a colonial Minuteman, get this, with a sword in his right hand and the Magna Carta in his left hand. That combination is, is worth thinking about. And looking close at the slide, you can read the uh, inscribed words in Latin, which translate, by the sword we seek peace, but peace only under liberty. Well, the Minutemen fought for peace and liberty, always carrying the spirit of the Magna Carta, the ageless symbol of peace but not without liberty, close to their hearts. Finally, the final remembrance, Ruthven Hodgman, the respected Westford historian, quotes an unnamed orator speaking about the historic day at Concord when the shot heard round their world was fired. Quote, love this quote, the minute men loaded their muskets, not with a ball only, but with a principle. And they brought down not a man, but a system. <clears throat> that kind of ends my <coughs> patriotic tour of Westford, Massachusetts. Can you see and feel the dimensions of what is possible? and the notoriety of the discovery. Just, it, it was flabbergast, flabbergasting to both of us. But our American flag constantly reminds me of the American bulwark at the Concord Bridge. Speaking of bridges, there's a bridge in Chelmsford, Massachusetts, which is right adjacent to Westford. This version of Old Glory waves brightly over the site of William Fletcher's home site in Chelmsford, Massachusetts. William Fletcher is Gershom Jr.'s great-great-grandfather. About 146 years separated them and is generation 11 of the Fletcher line. William was the son of Robert Fletcher, the first Fletcher in my Fletcher line to immigrate to America from England. Why the memorial? It is because the first town meeting of the founding of Chelmsford was held in William Fletcher's house on 22 September 1654. 
it seems that whenever the early Fletchers settled, they played a role in the, in the, uh, the town's founding. It was an astonishing to me to make this discovery. The awe of standing on that site and seeing its natural beauty as a memorial garden, sustaining the memory of the town's founding for the next 385 years and my great eight grandfather's role in it. The actual house had remained in the Fletcher ownership until the late 18th century when too weak then to stand any longer, it disintegrated. But the site of William's house has always remained as hallowed ground for William's successors. William was born in England and he came to America with his father, Robert, in about 1630, when they both arrived in Boston where they were urged on by an order of the king to settle 10 miles up the Concord River from Boston they got up there, it was an empty field, abandoned huts from probably from wandering uh, Native Americans. Well, I have a detailed version in the book about their subsistence existence in that town, which is pitiful. But they endured, they lived on. And uh, I, I was able in the, in Richard's lifetime to find two papers in particular in his life. I won't go into any more detail. It's detailed in the book. But two papers of Roger, Robert's life are especially memorable. And this you will find really unbe unbelievable. It's a, it's a charitable pledge, you know, to give money. In writing, and I found the written document with a signature of Robert Fletcher on it, to contribute five pounds, remember they're all still British, annually for a period of seven years to the fledgling college down the road, Harvard. <laughs> yes, Harvard. To support religious education. You know, Harvard at that point was the primary source of providing clergymen education and training at that time. And it was the first college formed in this country. Perhaps this philanthropic attempt in America to establish a college endowment there, think of how these struggling settlers could afford this kind of uh, philanthropy. But I think it's testimony to the strength of their religious beliefs in their newfound country and their complete acceptance of the principle of giving generously. The second document is Robert Fletcher's will. I found it. It's a masterpiece. I drew up a lot of wills in my legal career. This will was a masterpiece of theological and legal acumen and very personal. I quote extensively from in, in the book and marvel as a lawyer how it could pass today as expertly written document. It is a discovery that will endure long in the Fletcher line. To close the Fletcher line, I call your attention to a very historical juxtaposition involving two separated family generations in America. I've mentioned them. Gershom Fletcher Jr. and, and, uh, and Robert Fletcher. While, waiting, while uh, walking and visiting the city of Concord in 2012, this juxtaposition became very obvious. This is it. Robert was a founder of Concord and died there. Robert's great three grandson, Gershom Fletcher Jr., was a patriot who put his life on the line 146 years later to free the same colony that his great three grandfather had found, helped found. Both events, the founding of Concord and the Battle of the Concord Bridge, occurred within one mile of each other. 
We could walk it. From the book, of course Robert, a loyal British subject, until his death could never have conceived that within a walking distance from his home, his great three grandson would be so near to his home at the beginning of at the beginning military salvo for colonial freedom. We all know the outcome, but until you physically walk down the straight street in the beautiful city of Concord, now a population of 17,000 in 2010, do you feel what the founding achievement meant? The same feeling overtook me when I strolled across the nearby, now serene again, Concord Bridge from the, Minium, from the Minuteman Monument, a juxtaposition for the ages. Now, in, I have gone over an hour and a half, and I have the best story to tell yet. It only takes about 10 minutes. Are you for it? Okay. I would have, I would have gone home if you said no. <laughs> To introduce it, I took a picture in Washington, D.C. of the half of the front door to the U.S. Supreme Court to lead us into this discussion. Uh, one of the greatest links of our American law to that of our English forebears is the Magna Carta, which is, is emblazoned in bronze in the 16-ton doors of the Supreme Court building and it is one of the eight depictions of the most significant events in civilization that contributed to our American rule of law. On the bottom right panel, where the arrow points, is King John sealing the Magna Carta in 1215. I discovered much, much more about the link this linkage in research in English lines. So what happened? First, I tried to follow Robert Fletcher back to England and found his father, but could go no further. So that was a dead end. Yes, a rabbit hole I had to get out of. So uh, I was lucky to find the wife of, of uh, my great six grandfather, Stephen Fletcher, uh, who had a generational line of her own, went right up to the 1600s all the way, and, but when she got to the 16th, 1600s, she linked to a, a generation that was involved as a lower level, but yet noble position. And nobility in England is charted to the nth degree. Everyone who is a remote nobleman is cataloged because if everybody died and died and died and died, that person had a chance at the throne as a relative. So once I got into the bottom layer of that royal, I was able to zip right up. And I was amazed that I never knew that was possible. But it is because English royalty is very, very interrelated. If you're related to this person, it's likely you're related to that and so on up. It's a, they all intermarried. That was one of the ways that barons acquired power. I marry my daughter to the Duke of da da da, and then he's my friend, and then they have kids and marry, and then we're all friends, and we built power that way. So anyway, I was lucky to find uh, Betty Hildreth, uh, the wife of Stephen Fletcher, and she provided numeration all the way up through some through some English royalty to a very time very important time and place. And a passage from the book, which I'll read, sets the historical English stage. The atmosphere was serene. I've heard that word before. There were no buildings at Runnymede, just a vast acreage of flat land rising slightly at its perimeter. The quietude here was punctuated only by the sound of ripples from the snow, from the slow moving Thames River, and the cawing of an occasional raven standing guard on the highest limb of a tree along the river. Troops from baronages representing even the farthest fetch of England had begun to line up 
around the perimeter with pennants of all colors and designs raised. The troops were, were ever so quiet. One could feel the enormous tension in the air that fostered their absence and silence. Why did they sit tall on their mounts, suited in full armor? Why did they in total form an almost perfect full circle around the field in the middle of which their most hated enemies would present themselves? The most provocative question was, why did each fighting knight have one hand on his fighting sword? The answer to all of these questions is one word, trust, or lack thereof. The barons did not trust their king. This sly man, in their collective opinions, had abused them and permitted deceit to rule the land. They would by this evening, either by insurable peace, with enforceable ways to keep it so, or it would end up in all but bloody war. Into this circle of woven strength strode together my three great 23 grandfathers. John Plantagenet, King of England, William Marshall, first Earl of Pembroke, and Richard de Clare the Seventh, the Earl of Gloucester. And they were joined by my, by my great 22 grandfather, Gilbert de Clare, sixth Earl of Gloucester. It would be the rendezvous of the millennia. The historical juxtaposition, again, of these three of my great 23 grandfathers at any one place or time in and of itself transcends each and every genealogical discovery I would ever make. Of course, all three each knew each other and they were all there for a known reason, to make lasting enforceable peace. They did not contemplate, however, that the event they were sharing would carry the long-term significance that it did. The roles they played complemented the event perfectly. John, the leading monarch. William Marshall, one of the few respected barons. The other, uh, and, and, then, and, and then one of, well, it was Richard de Clare, the most outspokenly aggrieved baron, big mouth against the king. The other starring role was played by an unrelated person, Stephen Langdon, Archbishop of Canterbury, represented the Pope, church, and clergy. The disgruntled barons were the petitioners, and it seemed proper and logical that they commenced the proceedings by proffering their proposed peaceful solution. With much academic assistance from Archbishop Langdon, they prepared their written proposal named the Articles of the Barons. It contained a long list of royal wrongs, did this, they did that, and baronial rights. We should get this, we should have that, why don't we have this? Uh, numerous subjects raising from, ra uh, ranging from fishing and forest rights to abuses of royal administration and personal and property rights. Each of them was debatable, and they were always contradicting positions taken by both sides. The debate lasted for hours. Notes were taken, changes in terminology hammered out, words and ideas were changed. The debate ended and a rough draft was finally put in place as a skeletal, skeletal final proposal. To be legal, it had to be rewritten with the formality of a king's order, not just a, simply a bunch of barons' gripes about this and that and the other thing. As long as no substantive changes were made in the final king's charter, 
the barons and the archbishop could call it a day so long as the king would put his seal on this rough draft as the assurance that he was in agreement with it in principle. Not unlike we do in business transactions today. The king looked out over the grassy meadow and saw the hundreds of swords pointing at him. He felt the pressure of the draftsman breathing down his neck. He was outmanned. He was outmaneuvered. He was financially broke. He had no free will to say anything about it. He had no choice. This he did. He sealed it. Likewise, the assembled barons, acknowledging the agreement by collectively swearing an oath to uphold it and renewing their allegiance to the king, not knowing what would happen next at that moment. So, at, at, so what they did then, they dispersed to the middle of the field and the tables were set and they had a banquet and celebrated and drank their evening away. <coughs> To the rest of the future world, the Magna Carta was born. There are numerous provisions that foreshadow provisions of this US Constitution. The most famous words in the Magna Carta are, to no one will we sell, to no one will we deny, to no one will we delay right or justice. It's embedded in American law. I have also discovered many precursors to the provisions of the Magna Carta themes in the administration of other early English kings to whom I follow through a royal line of kingship, through uh, William the Conqueror and then through Flemish, uh, a series of nine Flemish dukes to the bloodline of Charlemagne, who is the generation number 40. Re there are revealing details in to await the reader of this final chapter of my multi-generational study of my uh, uh, ancestral past. So, I carry my uh, carry away from all of this is that the birth of Magna Carta was not just a flashpoint on the continuum of mankind's pursuit of liberty and justice. It created an actual spirit for our men and our patriots. In particular, and all for all of us who have descended from these great men to be kept alive and sustained forever. Maybe that's why Paul Revere depicted the Massachusetts Minuteman, not only with a sword in his right hand to fight to the death for freedom and liberty, but also his own Magna Carta in, the, in his left hand to provide the spiritual rock behind the fight. I leave you with these words of my own. Always remember the past. It is who you are. The present proclaims it. The future embraces it. Thank you. Now I have some books over there uh, that I have donated to the society as of their fundraising effort to raise money. And uh, all the proceeds of the book purchases go to the society, and I would be glad to uh, autograph, for whatever that's worth, any book that you, you buy. The hard covers are 20, and the, the uh, soft covers are 15. And uh, it's been a pleasure to be with you. It's been a pleasure to be in Richmond, and I wish you all the best for the future. Thank you, Jeff.